And project manager and team leader roles need to be recognised, but not as a hierarchical, master-slave, tasking type of thing, but as facilitative, collaborative. And then within the team, there are different skills. There are business skills, shown in orange. There are the technical skills and a variety of those, shown in green. And some kind of coordination from the, the sort of more management and facilitative roles are the things that are shown in blue. That's actually based on DSDM a turn. If you take, do something like Scrum, how many of you have come across Scrum as an approach? Okay. With Scrum, it's, it's a lot simpler in terms of the roles. We tend to have a product owner, we'll have a Scrum master, and we'll have the guys that do, you know, the team. And much simpler, but what people have to do and tend to do in large organisations is actually to come up with something rather like this. In fact, um, I was in the States with uh, some of the guys that, you know, sort of uh, are still active in evolving Scrum, and one of them pointed to that and showed it to another and said, we need that. Okay, so, but we can learn from other approaches. We can pick these things up. So that's the um, DSDM alien baby. Alien because it's only got one arm and its feet aren't attached. Um, and we need teams which are the right mix of the right skills, including the business skills. Keep them small. Make sure the leadership's facilitative. A team ethos, not a I've done my bit, it's your fault, but a success is everyone's success. Failure is something, well, hopefully failure isn't something that we're aiming for, but it's something that we are all a part of trying to avoid and trying to improve the situation so that we don't go there. And the idea of personal responsibility and empowerment comes into that. So, in summary, some values. Focusing on the business. Okay, prioritising what we do so that we don't compromise the quality by trying to rush to do absolutely everything. Let's do the important things, do them well, and do them in priority order. Okay, and communication, learning and evolving. All of these things within the Agile culture, but that we've got to get into the organisational culture if it's going to work. So that's Agile. What's leadership then? A few quotes. You come across this one? Leadership is a two-way street. Loyalty upwards to your money providers, basically, the people that are uh, sponsoring this, the people that need this for business reasons. Loyalty down towards your team. Okay, and I really, I've liked this one for a long time. We shouldn't be thinking of managing people. We manage things. Okay, we need to lead people. And they are attributed to Grace Murray Hopper, who, as well as being a computer programmer, is the person who is uh, often called the mother of COBOL, um, and has a lot of good thoughts about not just the development, but the leadership aspects. Another one I quite like, and I, I'd like this to be recognised by my leaders if I'm in an agile team. The best executive is one who has the sense enough to pick good people to do what he wants done, and the self-restraint to keep from meddling with them while they do it. Okay, show that to a few of our uh, senior management. And of course, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Now, you may have come across, um, if you're studying in this area academically, different styles of leadership. And three main leadership styles were rec recognised by Kurt Levine way back in 1939. It takes a long time for these things to really embed. The authoritarian, the autocratic, the participative, democratic leadership, and the delegative laissez-faire leadership. And I've brought in another um, protagonist here, which is, does anybody know what that is? We've got, we've got Megatron, we've got Optimus Prime, and that's the AllSpark cube, ultimately powerful, the, um, the president of life in any form, but it doesn't actually do anything for you, you know, and if you get hold of it, well, you know, it can be as bad as it can be good, and it's, it's up to you to make of it what you will. So the three, three major stars, and, and this is interesting because we tend to be coming from, in most large organisations, an authoritarian, authoritative, autocratic style of leadership. 
Okay, and this should be that clear expectations are provided on what and how, and then the group do what they're being asked to do. How often is it very clear? And that's where the, um, the Megatron behaviour often comes in. And Levine's findings were that in this situation, this is actually, if the directions are right and if the leader is the expert, the most speedy and in that respect the most effective. Okay? But the subordinates are less creative. We have one brain working instead of everyone in the team's brains. And this is where you get the blame. Well, I just did what I said, it was his fault kind of attitudes. So that's authoritarian, the autocratic style. The participative style, and I'm uh, likening this to Optimus Prime, <coughs> leaders offer guidance, but they enable the group. They empower the group and they do participate. They don't stand completely back. They do help to direct the group, help to motivate the group, but they let the group also have input. Okay, significant input and there's collaboration. And this, Levine found he's less productive in the absolute, you know, how much we've managed to get done sense. But the group are much more engaged and motivated and the product we get out is likely to be best. If I were an authoritative leader here and I wanted everybody at the other side of the room, and don't, please don't do this, but if I said stand, and you all did, and I said, walk over there, and you all did, I'd achieve it in a minute. If I were the participative style of leadership, and I said, um, what we need to do and the objective we need to achieve is we all need to be safe and happy and well fed, I think probably you should go over there. You'd all say, are you sure that's the right way to do it? And you'd be right. Okay, so we're, we're looking for more, more engagement of brains. I mean, why use one when you can use all that intellect that we have out there. So the groups are likely to be more engaged and motivated. So in terms of effectiveness rather than just sheer productivity, this is likely to give you the better products. Okay? And that might be what we're looking for in Agile, but look at the third style and see if you recognize this one. Where the leaders really empower the team but give little or no guidance and decision making is delegated to the group. The group are totally self-organizing, empowered to work out what they feel they need to do between them. This works best if the group members are experts and the group is not being led by an expert but the group themselves are experts. But we can't always get that. If we could have agile teams, all of whom were experts, we could work this way. But in any normal situation, and again, I'll think about the large corporates, we've got to bring people on. We've got to replace people who leave. We will have some learners at any point, and we've got to allow for that. And this can lead to poor motivation and poorly defined roles sometimes. People do what they, they feel they should do, but perhaps gaps arise because we haven't got any real structure to work in. And this actually in the studies that Levine did, is the least productive style of the three in terms of producing the right product in the right time in general. Okay, now there'll be exceptions to that if the group are all experts in their particular fields and we have the right mix of skills. But as I say, frequently we don't have that. And sometimes I've seen this being the style that's endemic in, for example, a scrum or a, an XP type of uh, environment and that leaders think that this is what they're supposed to do. Okay? There is a book that around called Stand Back and Deliver. You know, the idea of which is, you just let people get on with it. Now, it's not quite effective to do it that way. It's not tell them what to do, but it's not abandon all responsibility. And something else that's been interesting to me in trying to bring in transformation into large and already autocratic organisations and trying to change that culture from the bottom up has been that it's very much more difficult for a group to go from the authoritarian style than it is, uh, the authoritarian to the democratic style than it is to go the other way around. And that, that means that you'll struggle very hard to get people to be more and more agile, but as soon as they get a fright, they flip very quickly back into the authoritative style. Okay, so 
we have to work around this and I think this is where our values of maybe trust but courage, engendering trust to ourselves if we're the Agile team, having the courage to stand up to things that are being put to us and say, that will not work. Our personal responsibility, our collaboration, and respect for each other. So reminding ourselves of those things. But I've seen organizations struggle for a couple of years to get towards Agile, one fright, and they're straight back. You know, oh well, we'll just go back to telling people what to do. And of course, empowerment has to come from above. Otherwise, you think you're empowered, it's snatched away at the last minute. And what's the Agile leader doing? Sustaining the team culture. Okay? Enabling, facilitating communication. Keeping the teams on track if we're in the participative style. Protecting the team. Clarifying the objectives, but then enabling the team to get on with it. And making sure that we have the right skills, particularly the business involvement, which is a new aspect to our culture. And an Agile project manager, well, Agile projects need a different style of leadership because of the constant change that we're trying to embrace, because we are continually correcting course. And we still need to do things like monitor progress and keep that trust of the management above by showing that we are progressing and where we are very clearly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so an agile project manager should be targeting the team, motivating them, not directing them. That's all very well, but um, agile project leaders are not always easy to find. And they don't always look as different from the autocratic ones as uh, Optimus Prime and Megatron look. So how do we discover agile leaders? Well, again, can we learn something from the Autobots? Well, maybe we can because the Autobots have a matrix of leadership. So the Autobot matrix of leadership, a talisman passed down through the ages, enabling us to turn Autobots into higher powered beings. Wouldn't that be nice? And wouldn't you be like, delighted to know that we have an agile matrix of leadership? A talisman passed down from agile leaders across the world Work done in the US, the UK, all across Europe over the past few years to actually identify what are the skills and talents needed of our agile leaders. And to open this matrix is to release a wave of power from the spreadsheet. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Under a series of headings. And this is available to everyone. At the moment, the best place to find it is on the DSDM website, dsdm.org, which is going through a bit of um, a transformation at the moment. So if for any reason you don't find it, have a word with Katie or get in touch with me and we'll put you in touch with it. And it is a set of competencies. It really was worked out um, with people from the Agile Alliance, people from the DSDM Consortium, people from European Agile groups, um, the Agile Consortium there. and based on a lot of work over a period of two years to say what are the key elements of agile and agile leadership, what are the competencies we're looking for.